hope everybody is doing well today. Welcome um, to our sketch along. So I've been chatting with Susan a little bit in chat about ant mimics, and those are pretty amazing. She saw an ant mimic that was a pictured wing fly. Um, so I think that that is pretty awesome. Hi, Jody. She's here too. Oh man. Are those um, Burnham Forest now as Firefly Fridays? Is that uh, a forest that's local to you? That's pretty awesome. Um, all right, so I am looking at two different. I'm looking at two different beetles here, and so you guys know that. Woohoo! <laughs> Hi, Avia. Welcome! I'm happy to see you here too! Now, here's something kind of funny. You guys are, know and are aware that I use this little red dot, kind of like my pointer to kind of point out features while I'm chatting and stuff. And I had a student recently, I think uh, they're 10 or 11, say, why do you use a little dot when you could make any graphic you wanted? They said, why not make a fly with an arrow? Or why not make a fly pointing at things? And I said, well, I guess I can. And so, here we have Mr. Fly, and he has an arrow, and he can point to things. <laughs> Hi, Tamara. Welcome. I'm glad that you guys have a small group of people that you sketch with. So I'm glad you are here with Avea. Now, um, something that is kind of crazy is that we are looking at two different aquatic... Don't you love my little fly? Oh, man. So, our little buddy doesn't have a name yet, but if you guys come up with a name for him, then he might adopt a name. All right. So... <laughs> Mr. Fly, he's going to help us out by pointing out features for our beetles. Now, um, we have two different beetles here. Um, I have a, the predaceous diving beetle is this one over here on the right. And this one on the left is actually what we call a water scavenger beetle. They're both aquatic. They're both have, um, they both have their distinctive swimming legs. Um, that's actually going to be a new word for us today. That's natatorial. Um, it means to natatorial legs are these legs that insects are going to be using to swim. Um, and so you can see on the hind legs, they've got these long hairs. They kind of use them like paddles, and we'll be able to see that a little later. Um, but um, the one that we, I think that we want to focus on today is the predaceous diving beetle. And then after we go about looking at the characters of the predaceous water diving beetle and we sketch it, we can go ahead and look at the scavenger beetle and kind of compare those features. Because when you look at them, uh, first name Dippy, Dippy the fly, <laughs> possibly. All right. And so when we look at them overall, they almost look like the same beetle. They're both large, they're both black, they both swim around in the water. Um, but we're going to notice after kind of looking at them a little bit that they have significantly different characteristics. All right. So I'm going to go ahead and pull this predaceous diving beetle over. Sorry about my nail polish. I need to remove it, you know. All right. So let's go ahead and flip him over to where he's supposed to be. But I need to go ahead and give you guys a length first. And I know that um, my beetle is just too large to measure under my microscope. So if I am measuring my beetle from the front of its head to the back of its elytra, his body is rounded, so it's a little difficult. But it's looking like about 3.8 or 3.9 centimeters long. So um, our our diving beetle is almost is almost four centimeters long, 
And it, I know that this specimen is female, and it doesn't have to do with her butt, so I know Susan up there at, wants to learn all about diving beetle butts, and admittedly, I don't know if I have any cool facts about diving beetle butts, so I'm, uh, I'm sorry to disappoint on that level. I will continue trying to find a fun fact somewhere in my head. I will find one. Terry, like wings. I like that. Oh, Dippy is short for Diptera. Terra, like a pterodactyl. All right, so our overall shape. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and give us. Predacious diving beetle. Now, predaceous diving beetles have their own family. They are in the family Dytiscidae. It is spelled this way, I believe. Sometimes when I spell them, yeah, that's right. Every now and again when you spell a Latin word and it, um, you're not exactly sure. <laughs> All right, so um, Dytiscids, that's going to be their family name. So all predaceous diving beetles are Dytiscids. And that actually comes, I believe the word is Greek, um, but it comes from the word Dytikos, meaning to dive. Dytiscidae. All right, so our overall, I know Marley is in the Galapagos, but hey, uh, Marley is in the Galapagos, right? So he better be bringing us back awesome bug pictures. That's all I have to say about that. I need a, at least one picture of a sphinx moth from him in, in the Galapagos. All right, so you can see I pulled my specimen back over here really quick so that you can see the overall shape of our beetle. Um, this specimen has its legs tucked pretty well, um, so we're going to actually have to flip our specimen over to see the characteristics on the legs. Um, but then we can kind of sketch the legs out, at least those hind legs that are big swimming legs. Um, because those, a lot of times, will have a more natural position like this, where their legs will kind of be um, out in a swimming position. All right, so we're going to go ahead and give ourselves this fun oval. Now, um, you can see from our sketch, Dippy can show you here, there is a line, a horizontal line right here. That signifies the separation between this section, the pronotum, and the section underneath, which are going to be his elytra that you can see are very long. So I'm going to go ahead and give us just this overall shape. Give him a head. And then make sure he's very, very slim lined, right? So he's this beautiful kind of oval shape. He's kind of the shape of an egg. All right. Is Marley a fan of the reptiles then? So I'm just trying to give my hydrophilid the most realistic kind of longer body shape. I'm going to go ahead and just make, I'm going to make the head even with everything. And then when I come back and sketch it, I'll be able to kind of give all of those bonus features. So we have um, a narrowing at the end of the elytra and more rounded up here in the head. Now we can go ahead and give our sketches. Oh, yes, he loves serps. Very cool. Alrighty. I'm going to go ahead and zoom in on some features on this head and turn on some more light. Let there be light. So now, Dippy, get out of the way. He's just trying to help, ladies and gentlemen. 
All right, so I was trying to get the differentiation and some of the coloring here because this, this specific diving beetle is not actually all black. He does have this ring of, I would either call it like a, a brown or a maroon red color. You can see up here near the front of his face near where the clippiest might be um, <clears throat> up here in the front. And we have our two very large compound eyes here and here. Um, around the edges of the compound eyes, you'll see they're kind of this lighter coloration. Now that lighter color is natural to the compound eyes. So it's not any kind of buildup of dirt or sediment or anything like that. When I first saw it, I thought that it might be sand buildup around the eye. But it is not. That is actually a two-toned compound eye. And I know that a lot of you um, like to see the uh, like to see the textures in the compound eyes. Yes, Susan, I can go back to the larger view really quick. Let me get a good picture on my microscope before I turn it off. All right, there you go, Susan. Um, that is our beetle, and it is just almost four centimeters long. Um, it probably measures in, if you consider the rounding of the head and the body, it's probably about 3.8 or 3.9 centimeters. How big the head and the pronotum are relative. I guess I also can... This is as far zoomed out as I can make it so that you can see both the size of the head up here and the size of the pronotum, which is, I think, also what you were asking. <laughs> no problem. All right, so I'm going to go ahead right about here where I was looking at where my head was going to start. And I'm going to be erasing up here because I just want to create my own head shape. Um, because you can see that the head almost um, sticks out a little bit away from our base shape. Um, the edges of the pronotum, oh, that's not the fly. The edges of the pronotum um, are angled, are angular right here on the side. So they come up, they have this angle, and then they come down a little bit before they point back up. So when I'm creating the this angle for my head, I'm just going to bring these lines in just a little bit and give myself that kind of that little shelf to fit the com to fit the head onto. All right, and then, uh, yeah, I, I want to make sure, Susan, that I'm not going too fast and that everybody can sketch the um, at sketch at their pace. So thank you for slowing me down momentarily. It's a good thing. All right, um, so I'm going to go ahead and get our head start. Go ahead and get the head started. So I want to give myself a little bit of space for those compound eyes and then there it's not um it's not an even d shape there is a little bit of a protuberant protuberance it's, it protrudes a little bit away from that shape when you get up here into the head area that's going to be the clippius um or the section of the head that kind of leads up to the mouth I don't know how to define the clippiest. All right, and so it comes up just a little bit. Now, there's a couple of characteristics that are important when we are looking at ditiscids, especially because I mentioned a little earlier that, um, that ditiscids and hydrophilids, that other diving beetle that we looked at momentarily, um, they both have very similar body shapes, but there are, let's say three, 
I would probably count three different characteristics that are significant in between the predaceous diving beetles and the water scavenger beetle, which is this friend right here. All right. Number one are their antenna. Um, diving beetles have long filiform antenna. Uh, filiform is spelled this way. It means that um, it means that the antenna are in the form of a filament, right? They are long and thin, and many insects are going to have filiform antenna. Make sure that I, yeah, make sure the Dippy's wings don't get in the way. All right, and the well, he's in the middle of my eye now. There we go. That's better. Okay. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and get these eyes in here. And what I see when I'm sketching the eyes is that there's almost these L's that, um, that you can see that the eyes kind of have that angle. And then I want to make sure that they're the same on both sides. My left one just got a little bit smaller than the right one. All right, so we have our big compound eyes, and they are two-colored, right? So you can go ahead um, and even darken the center and leave this light ring. That might help kind of distinguish our compound eyes from um, other insects' compound eyes that we've sketched. Now, um, we also are seeing those long filament filament. Um, filiform antenna and so those are coming out kind of from underneath the eye so we're gonna be going ahead and what I do is I go and give it an individual line first and then I'm gonna use that line to create the segments so the uh, antennal segments so maybe it looks about like that and then I will just build the segments around this line. It looks like we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, approximately nine segments. That's what I can see. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. All right, so we've got nine antennal segments. I'm going one, two, three, Four, five, six, seven, and they kind of get smaller. Eight, nine. So I've got that long, thin antenna, and I want to make sure that they kind of get thinner at the end. I was starting to get kind of large, so I'm going to go back and erase some of these so that I can make them thinner. And a lot of times when I'm sketching these segments, I'm going to zoom in a little bit, I create these um, I create these shapes that are almost like flattened triangles so that they fit into each other. So that when I'm going back and filling these in with pen, I make sure that each segment, there's, uh, there's segmentation to it. Because when you think about an insect skeleton, right, the insect skeleton is kind of like a suit of armor. It cannot bend unless you have a segment, unless you have a break in the exoskeleton and you have some type of joint. And so when you think about an insect's antenna, insect antenna um, are very flexible. They're moving all over the place. And the only way for an insect to have antenna that are moving all over the place is to make sure that the, um, is to make sure that they've got many, many segments because they can only move at the joints. All right, so nine segments. Now, that's going to be characteristic number one, are our filiform antenna. I fifth. Uh, 
Um, the second characteristic is actually also on the head, and it is right here. You see how these are long and segmented and near the head? Those are labial palps. All right. We have in the past... Um, Susan's asking if there are more segments underneath the eye that we cannot see. I don't believe so, but we can go ahead and flip it over and check and see. Oh, look at that. There are. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. Look at that. Yes, Susan, you are correct. There are two segments of the antenna that you can act, you cannot actually see from above. So the total segmentation on the antenna, thank you for double checking me on that, uh, making me put my specimen over and actually count. There are 11 segments. It's just two aren't visible from the top. And actually, when you look at this first one, this scape, um, the scape has, let's see if we can kind of see this. The scape doesn't just meet the next segment um, evenly all the way around. The scape has kind of two pegs on either side of the pedestal that it's using to hold on to that segment. That's kind of cool. I think you guys can see that. So, um, the scape is the name of the first segment of the antenna, and the pedestal is the name of the second segment of the antenna. All right, now we were looking at the labial palps. Come on, computer, welcome back. There we go. Alrighty, so right about here, you can see the labial palps on my beetle. So these are these little segmented pieces. Um, it's going, they're going to use their labial palps to kind of help push their food into their mouth. Because these are predatory beetles, um, they're going to use those to kind of, um, to, to, to push insects into their mouth, right? Once they catch them. Yum, yum, yums. All right. So the characteristic that we're looking on these is that the labial palps are shorter than the antenna. All right. Um, and you might think, hey, Trisha, aren't most labial palps shorter than the antenna? And the answer is yeah. Yeah, most of the time, it, when you're looking at insects, the antenna have to be nice and long, and the labial palps are going to be short. So this is what we would look at as a common characteristic that lots of things have, but when you're comparing this beetle against a hydrophilid, the characteristic flips. All right. So... We can see three segments of the labial palps from the top. So I'm going to go ahead and give myself three segments up here. Um, maybe I'll make them a little flatter, though. Yeah. And so our second characteristic for ditiscids is that their labial palps are shorter than their antenna. Labial palps. All right, so I'm going to go into my sketch. I'm going to darken some of these lines to make sure those are all good. And I'm going to get this pronotum finally started. So I'm going to get this angle nice and rounded out. Um, I do want to make sure that I have that dark brown or orange border on my beetle. 
Uh, that's likely going to help us identify this specimen, but I don't have it identified any further than family. Um, so I can't really help with much after that. Let's see. So I'm just going to go ahead and give my annotations for where the color changes so that in the future when I am coloring in some of my sketches or adding color to my sketches, I, um, I can know where the separation happened. All right, so that right there, that segment, that, that, that um, whole plate behind the head, we know it and love it and call it the pronotum. Now, we're going to go ahead and zoom back. Now, this is as zoomed out as I can get. So there's some features that I want to notice. And then we can zoom in and see about texture on the beetle. Now, I'm going to admit, there's not going to be a lot of texture, all right? And that's because they're trying to stay as, um, I want to say aerodynamic, but it's not. It's aquadynamic. There's a word for that. They want to be able to be able to have a body shape that allows them for smooth swimming. All right, so um, right about here on uh, the center of our body, if you look right about there, there's a little U. And that little segment right there, we call the scutellum. It's right here. It's this little U. It's, gen it's, always, on the, it's always on the center line, and it is always in between the wings. All right, um, the line that separates the pronotum and the elytra down here is pretty horizontal, although now that I'm looking at it, it does angle back just a little bit at the edges, so I'm going to give my edges a little bit of a, a curve like this. All right, and then we're going to go ahead and finalize the outsides of our elytra. Um, I want to see if I can, I'm trying to get a good, but what, what I'm going to end up doing is just going ahead and zooming in, seeing if we can see any texturing. And then I'll bring the specimen over so that we can see its whole body. There's what I was looking for right there. A little bit. All right. I'm going to bring our specimen over here so that we can look at its overall body shape. We know that the uh, what we're looking at over here are the elytra, that's our word for the hard outer shell of the wing of our beetle, right? So if we're looking at the first wings, the first, the four wings of a beetle, they're going to be called elytra because they are hard, they're nice and sclerotized. All right, giving the overall body shape, I think that my beetle is going to be longer than I originally planned. But that is fine. Yeah. So my beetle has just gotten about a third larger from my practice sketch, but that fills out a lot better. So I have my overall outline for my beetle's body. I'm going to make sure that this comes to a rounded end. And then the very center of our body, the scutellum all the way to our tip of our abdomen, there's going to be a straight vertical line. And I have previously been doing these freehand, but I can do them with a ruler. Yeah. 
watch me go over it just a little bit to make it match everything else. <laughs> All right. Now, around the edges of our elytra, this orange actually continues on. So I'm going to go ahead and give us the, that orange stripe all the way around the edges of the body of my beetle. All right. You'll mention, you'll notice that um, I haven't mentioned our third characteristic. So there are three um, characteristics that separate these two families of beetles. And the last one is on the underside. So I'm going to show you something kind of fun. And then we'll get about to sketching the legs. Oh, also what I wanted to mention about this image before I turn it off. Um, the outside of our elytra of these beetles are a lot of times very, very smooth. All right, they are very, very flat. And this helps them, this helps them glide through the water. Now, predaceous diving beetles, diving beetles have this really, really interesting mating game that is happening where, um, where they're actually evolving, the female beetles are evolving away from mating with the males. So um, they're actually kind of running away from natural selection wise, having go mating with the males because um, during the mating process, the females, a lot of times they're, they're going to be underneath the males and these diving beetles, they need to break the surface to breathe. They actually were going to hold an air bubble underneath their elytra. And so, um, sometimes these beetles will mate for so long that the males, um, that the, that the females can literally run out of air right? And that's no good. So the females over the course of time are coming up with ways of getting away from, getting away from the males. Um, one of those things was just swimming really fast and being kind of slippery, right? And then over the course of time, the males actually gain suction cups on the bottom of their front pair of legs so that they have the ability to kind of suction them cup to the female's back so that they can hold on. And then the ladies evolved and adapted the ability to, um, the, the ladies adapted the ability to, um, well, they, they adapted, let's see, after the, after the sponges, sorry, I got distracted by my computer. After the suction cups, the ladies got ridges on their backs, right? So the suction cups don't work as well if there are ridges underneath the suction cup. And so a lot of times when we're looking at female diving beetles, many of the female diving beetles will actually have ridges on their backs um, so that the males have a harder time kind of suction cupping and holding on to their backs. And now the male suction cups are adapting to fit and to align with the grooves and the striations on the ladies' backs. Um, it's kind of a crazy story if you ever look into it. All right. We are going to be looking for something that I call a ventral keel. Now ventral, meaning on the bottom, and this is our predaceous diving beetle. All right, so when we're looking at our beautiful predaceous diving beetle, we've got it flipped over. I want to go ahead and look at the bottom side on the center. So this is the bottom of our insect. We can see there's a middle leg here and here. These are the hind, this is where the hind legs are connected. And I'm looking for a keel, kind of like an extension of the exoskeleton that would run along the midline of my beetle. Now, predaceous diving beetles don't have this. All right, so what I'm looking for doesn't exist on this beetle. 
Um, that's actually the characteristic, the third characteristic to define the predaceous diving beetles versus my water scavengers, my, um, my hydrophilids. So if I go ahead and I flip my hydrophilid over, I'll be able to show you what a keel looks like. And they're actually a really cool adaptation that these aquatic beetles have. All right, check that out. So you can see this kind of central midline. It's kind of this projection on the bottom side of the exoskeleton on the ventral. And then there's this little spine that even continues out. And this works very much like the keel of a ship. It helps them stay swimming straight or it helps them navigate somehow, which I think is kind of amazing. Hydrophilids are the only aquatic beetle that has this ventral keel. And so if you're looking at a water beetle and you flip it over and you see this long, what almost looks like a pin or a spike on the bottom side of the beetle, we know that it is what we call a high, we call them hydrophilids or the hydrophilidae, the water scavenging beetles. All right, and our ditiscid, the, the beautiful beetle that we have been sketching, does not have that ventral keel. All right. Our chat got a little quiet. How is everybody doing? Is everyone all right out there? doing fine out there all right let's see I want to make sure that we get a good view of these hind legs because these are the natatorial or the diving legs of our diving beetle right so I feel like they are super important oh Susan I love it when you're chatty you can be as chatty as you want I just wanted to make sure I didn't lose everybody in my in my quick mating beetle story. I actually did create a whiteboard video, um, a three minute video. I think it's called Mating Wars and Diving Beetles. And it explains that whole and it, it explains that whole interaction between the males and the females and how they're adapting. Um, over the course of time away from mating with each other, which is really, really fascinating because most animals change and adapt to be able to better mate with each other or to better find each other. The males become beautifully pretty birds because they want to attract the ladies or they make awesome nests or they make really impressive balls of poop. Um, but diving beetles are like, uh, no, we are evolving away from each other. We don't want anything to do with this. And they are continuing to do it, which I find fascinating. <laughs> Yay. <clears throat> All right. So, um, I want to, I'm going to go ahead and we're going to start sketching our legs from the back up. I think in, I mean, in my opinion, the hind legs are going to be the most important of the legs, but we are going to be able to see maybe a little bit of the front legs and likely most of the hind legs. So we can go ahead. Yeah, the ladies are just trying to survive. All right, so if I imagine my pronotum and I'm going ahead and kind of imagining where the legs are coming out. So my pronotum, the legs are going to be coming out around 
here and coming out. Then my middle legs are going to be right about here. And then my hind legs are going to be coming out right about here. So that kind of gives me an idea of where I'm kind of starting those lines. And then they come out like this. So I'm starting my hind legs about halfway down the elytra. And a lot of times I like to kind of give myself some stick legs just to work off of how long and the angles that I want to work with. So those are going to be kind of my stick legs. And when I'm looking at this, I have likely, you know what, I need I'm gonna pull the legs in just a little bit. I'm gonna pull my legs in just a little bit to help with those angles. Yeah. All right. So this first kind of little stubby bit, this is going to be our femur. This is the generally the first longest section of the leg. It goes from here at the base to right about here. And if I was to take this femur between the femur and the tibia and kind of pull that out, you can kind of imagine how much of that femur would be visible. It's not going to be a lot. And so it's just going to, on our stretch, going to be kind of like a nub. It's just essentially where our leg is going to start. That's the end of the femur. All right. And then we're going to go ahead and zoom in, and we're going to check out this tibia, and we're going to see about its shape. Look at that. Two tibial spines. All right, so when I am looking at the shape of my tibia, I'm starting right about here and I'm going to into right here. So it's not an incredibly long tibia. In fact, I think most of this leg are is tarsal segments, especially that long kind of part that makes it look like it's a swimming leg. Those are all tarsal segments. But we do have this spine here and this spine here. We have two tibial spines or two tibial spurs. And those are facing in towards the beetle. So when I'm sketching this, I'm going to go ahead and the femur and the tibia meet at an angle. So I'm going to go ahead and give myself an angle here at the edge. And then it's not a very long segment, and it looks like it's even a little longer towards the outside than the inside. All right, so that's going to be kind of my segment for my tibia. It's got this longer kind of segment on the outside, and I might erase that so that it's not so dark. It's not really a spine. It's more of just like a projection of the, uh, of the segment. And then we have two tibial spurs along the inside of our tibia. All right, and then we can sketch a, skip over to the tarsal segments. Which are so fluffy! And they're going to be so hard to count! I'm having a hard time counting these segments, but ladies and gentlemen, you might be able to help me. Maybe I'll zoom in a little bit and we'll move it through. Let's see. All right, so here are the tibial spurs. 
And it looks like the first segment of the tarsi of the, the first one is right here, so it ends about here. The second one ends here. The third one ends here. And we have four and then one more that's a little further. Five. I believe we have five tarsal segments on the hind leg here. One, two, three, four, five. Is there a spur coming off of the outside or is that just an illusion? Um, it's not a full spur coming off of the other side. I'm going to go ahead and zoom in to show you that. All right, so on the inside of the leg here and here, we have two tibial spurs. Right On the outside of the leg, there isn't a full spur, but if you look, there is an angle. You can see that it kind of points down right about here. And so I wouldn't say that there is a spur, but if you added a little bit of an angle on the outside of the leg, that would be a correct that would be a correct sketch. Now this down here that we're seeing is also not considered a spur. That is actually just stray hair from our diving legs, from our swimming legs. This thing right here. So this is hair. It, they have this golden kind of swimming hair, and then you have that tibial spur. Did I answer your question? That thing below slash behind the joint. Look at that, there's a little forked guy. I don't know what you would call that. I wonder if I can get the focus perfect enough to show you that. I cannot. There is a really cute little double forked feature way back there. And I don't have the ability to show it to you, but it's adorable. Darn it. There's like a little fork back there, but my uh, computer isn't doing so well. Good. I'm glad I answered your question. Ah, that silly stray hair. Alrighty. So I'm glad we got that figured out. Now I'm going to go ahead and turn my sketch on and see if I can get my sketch of these tarsal segments happening. So we've got five segments, the first one being the longest, and all of the preceding segments getting smaller and smaller. Uh, I went a little bit long. We're going to try that one more time. One, two, all right, so I've got these five tarsal segments and they go from fairly large down all the way to these very, very small segments. And then along the inside of those legs, we have these long, fine swimming hairs that are beautiful and gold. And this form, this leg form, is called natatorial.
And um, it's funny because when I think of insects, a lot of times I think of, you know, Latin and Greek, word, Greek roots. But for natatorial, I always think of nadar, which is um, Spanish for to swim. Natatorial, swimming legs. All right, I'm going to go ahead and sketch my, my, the leg that I haven't sketched yet. I'm trying to make sure that all of the angles stay very similar, but my, my other side is always just a little bit of a faster sketch. So let's see. We've got these two tibial spurs, and then one, two... Three, four, five, and then our nice long swimming hairs. Oh, that's so cool. I'm really happy with this so far. Look at that. All right, I'm going to erase this little circle that I put in here that notifies me of where my hind legs started. All right, my middle legs are going to be coming out right about here. Are the gold hairs on the tarsal segments on both sides of the tarsi or on just the side that we are seeing? We are looking at the top. How do I explain this? If you imagine the lay, if you imagine the tarsi tarsal segments um, like this, um, what we are seeing is that that black shiny part, that sclerotized part, is kind of like the top, and then the hairs cover the entire bottom. So the hairs are not all the way the the swimming hairs don't go all the way around the legs. Um, they are mostly focused on one side of the legs. Now, I'm going to go ahead and flip specimens on you really quick because my hydrophilid is going to have, it's very similar to my predaceous diving beetle, and it's going to be able to show you kind of what I'm talking about. Yes. All right. So these, if we zoom out really quick, these are the hind legs of my hydrophilid, my water scavenger beetle. And these are also natatorial legs. They have very long tibial spur. That is one crazy tibial spur. All right, and then um, these are going to be our tarsal segments. And when we zoom in on our tarsal segments, we'll notice that the hair is mostly towards the body. Let's see. Now, obviously, my ditiscid has, has a lot more of this beautiful golden hair, um, and the shape of their leg is just a little bit different. But you can see that all of these long golden hairs are lined up along the inside of the leg, and that's very characteristic of, um, of swimming legs. They have those long sweeping hairs on the inside. Yes, exactly. Very good. Yep, yep, yep. Alrighty. Now, I will get the, the middle legs. So you can see that the middle legs are going to be very similar to any other beetles that we, to many other beetles that we've looked at. Their front pair and middle pair of legs are walking legs. We, we call walking legs ambulatory. All right, so you can see here, this is our femur. Um, that little segment at the base, that's what we call the coxa. That's kind of our hip bone. 
And then we've got the tibia, the tibial spur, and these tarsal segments that are kind of covered in orange fluffy hair. Or maybe that's sediment. They might be covered in dirt. <clears throat> We're going to have to zoom in on that. And then it does have two little tarsal claws at the very end of that middle leg. All right. So when we are sketching our middle legs, they also do point backwards. Our, our femurs are also going to just show a little bit, just like here, our femur showed just a little bit. And then our tibia is this segment right here. Maybe our, you know what? I think our femur would go up this way and then our tibia would come back down. Imagining how they walk. All right, I think that we are only going to be able to see the tibia. Yes, we're only gonna be able to see the tibia from the top. So the end of the tibia has that spur. It's gonna look something like, I want to make sure I've got about the right. Yeah, that's better. Okay, so I'm taking an angle right about here from the top of the elytra, and that's where I'm going to be putting my tibia. Now, the tibial spur is that nice long spine on the inside of my tibia, and it's going to go right about here. And then I'm going to go ahead and we can zoom in on these tarsal segments. That's what I really want to check out. Because I want to see what's happening here. One, two, three, what? One, two, three, four. I'm counting approximately five tarsal segments. I'm counting, let's see, one, two, three. Four. Let's see. One, two. Looks a lot like four on the computer. So the segment that I'm having a hard time telling if it's one segment or two segments is right about here. It's either one, two, three, four, five. You see how there's kind of this line right about here? in my image. But I think that that looks like it might just be a little bit of sculpturing in my tarsal segment. I think it's four. One, two, three, four. I can look it up. Give me two seconds. Dietiscids have a 555 five, five tarsal formula. All right, so that means that there are five segments. So those are actually two separate segments. It does look a little bit like it's sculpturing, but there are five tarsal segments here. One, two, three, four, five. I really like these, the spines and the sculpturing on these tarsal segments. I'm going to go ahead and see if I can zoom in any further. I think that they're kind of cool. On the edge of every single one of these tarsal segments, they also have these really sharp looking spines along the edges. 
When you zoom in too far, you need too much light. Bring the light. That's really cool. I'm a fan. All right. So I'm going to go ahead and add my tarsal segments, making sure I've got five. So let's see. About one. And then making sure at the very end of our leg, we give ourselves those tarsal claws. I do want to give my beetle its legs on both sides this time. I think that it's going to give it beautiful symmetry. All right, so let's talk about, <clears throat> Susan asked me earlier if I could think of something fun about predaceous diving beetle butts, and it occurred to me that I might be able to share a fun fact with you about diving beetle butts. Now, predaceous diving beetles do not have gills. So they don't have the ability to breathe underwater all the time. Like some insects, like mayflies or dragonflies or damselflies, all of those insects have gills. Whereas diving beetles don't have gills. They need the ability to break the water surface so that they can breathe. And they will open up the back end, right? Not their abdomen, so not not their butt, but they will hide an air bubble in between their body and their elytra. So what we can see here are the elytra, but underneath these, there's actually a little space under here to hold the air bubble. And from what you know about insect breathing, you might, um, you might take that leap and say their spiracles are actually also underneath their elytra, right? So they're, those little holes that help my beetle to breathe are found underneath my elytra. And so when he collects that whole air bubble and he fills that up, he's also filling up the space um, that he's going to be able to breathe through, right? Because my insect doesn't need to breathe through his mouth. He has those holes in his body, those spiracles, to be able to breathe. Now, my... Dytiscid's front legs are very, very similar to the middle legs. They have, oh, come on. I heard my computer beep, and now my microscope program, oh, froze for a moment, but it's back. All right. All right, so I wanted to scooch this. Look at those tarsal claws, man. Terry says, look at those tarsal claws. Those are long and pointy and sharp. All right, so this is the front leg of my diatissid. And, um, and we can see that it looks very, very similar to the middle leg. Um, admittedly, I don't think that we're going to be able to see too much of the front leg. You know what? Let's go for it. Let's do it. I know that they have five tarsal segments. One, two, three, four, five. Yes. So Susan wants to know what they look like when they walk because she kind of imagines them just like dragging these legs behind them. And that's, 
I mean, kind of how they do it. They do have these two tibial spurs, and I do think their tibial spurs do kind of help push them along. So when they're walking, <clears throat> they don't stand up and walk on those legs, right? They don't have the ability. But they do kind of have the ability to push themselves across the ground. So when these beetles land, a lot of times they're not like walking across the ground. They're kind of look they almost look like they're trying to swim across the ground they kind of push themselves um you can almost imagine almost imagine like how a turtle might move kind of sideways like that that's kind of the movement that they do with their legs um and then these tibial spines i imagine kind of help grab and push sediment along um but yeah they do look a little bit like a dilapidated seal because they don't have the ability to stand up on these, right? So their abdomen kind of slouches back just a little bit. Um, that is the same with hydrophilids and itiscids. Both diving beetles and water scavenger beetles are going to kind of look like a, a weird seal. Now, I want to give my diving beetle front legs that you can't see because they're tucked up under the head. And how I would imagine that is I would go ahead and give myself a femur coming out. And then I would make my tibia kind of moving forward up towards the head. And just kind of tucking those segments under. Because that's what a lot of times they're going to look like anyway. They kind of, they swim with their legs kind of out like this with their angles out. And then their feet kind of are near their head. I am happy with that. Look at him. Aww, we have a beautiful Ditissid. And we learned about all three of its characteristics with the labial palps the filiform antenna and having no keel on the ventral side no little keel on the ventral side now because we learned those three characteristics on my diticid we're not going to sketch a hydrophilid tonight we don't really have the time but what we can do what we can do is look at my hydrophilid and kind of compare those three features we've already seen the keel so that's no big deal, but I do want to show you both the antenna and the labial palps. Um, Susan asks, can they fly too? That's hardly fair. Yes, they do have the ability to fly also. They have full membranous wings underneath their um, four wings and they fly. They fly well. Um, they will fly from their water body to any bright light source at nighttime. Um, out west and in areas where you have lots of water bodies, you'll actually find these beetles all over gas stations because they'll fly out of the water and they'll be attracted to the lights. Um, so yes, they do have the ability to fly. Now, a lot of times, this is kind of a funny mini story, a lot of times in places where diving beetles are numerous, where there's lots and lots of them, people will tell stories that they came out to their car and their car had diving, like, diving beetles on it, right? And the very beginning of the morning. Well, black vehicles reflect very similarly to a water body. So when my diving beetles are looking for a place to dive into the water at night, um, 
every now and again, they will go into a diving motion and they'll try and dive right into a car. And sometimes they'll hit the car so hard they'll actually die on impact. So they think they're diving into water, but it's just that reflection that the car is giving off and they're diving into steel. That doesn't work out well for them. You should definitely look out for them on your road trip. For sure. I've seen so many of these guys on, on road trips out west. Especially at gas stations. Go looking at nighttime. Alrighty. Now, I want to show you a couple of really wild looking characteristics on the head of this beetle. Now, this is not that diving beetle that we've been looking at. This is what we call a water scavenger beetle. Um, it's in the family Hydrophility, meaning water-loving beetles. All right, and there are two characteristics we want to see. One, that their antenna are actually clubbed and not filiform. And two, that their labial palps or their mouth fingers are longer than their antenna. All right. a good angle for you ladies and gentlemen in two seconds that's kind of a good angle that one goes down Alright, so I think I found an angle that is going to work for us. Alright, if we look right about here, that's the compound eye um, behind, right? So behind this line and that line, you can see this compound eye right here. Now, this is the segment for the antenna. Now, our antenna is long, long, has a couple of shorter, kind of smaller segmented bead-like bead -like segments, and then becomes fairly wide right about here. Now, it's, um, now this is the, uh, the front leg kind of getting in the way. But you can see that it, it's, this antenna is nice and straight. It gets a little thinner, and then it gets wide at the end. And that's where it ends, is right here. This is the entire antenna. So you can see that the antenna on scavenger beetles is pretty short. And then we're going to look at this labial pulp that starts way up here, has this segment, another segment, and there's actually a third segment that goes even further. So if we look at the other one, I think the other one is even more visible, but it wraps around the head. So this is our labial pulp. It starts, it starts way up here, comes down the body, wraps around this way, and there's a third segment that goes even further. And so you can see that they have incredibly long labial pulps, or really, really long mouth fingers. <laughs> And that's the, those are the big characteristics between the two families. So now, if you see big aquatic beetles out there in the world, you'll know how to tell them apart. Why, rather, whether they are a scavenger beetle or a diving beetle. I'm going to go ahead and put the leg under the microscope really quick. Because I think that that's a cool picture. All right. So my question to you, Susan, you're going on a road trip out west. That's exciting. Where? What states are you heading to? So this, those are my beautiful specimens. 
So the difference in the labial palps and the antenna is a difference in lifestyle. It's a difference in the families in general. They actually, um, they're fairly separate. They're even in separate suborders in, in the order beetle, in the coleopterans, which is really interesting. Um, so... <clears throat> The predatory, the, the predatory beetle, the one that we sketched today, is going to be eating other insects, whereas our, scav our water scavenger beetle is going to be more of a cleaner up crew person. Um, so I wonder if that has to do something with these longer labial palps. From New York to Montana. And by way of the Great Lakes, oh, that's exciting. Yeah, you're going to see all of the bugs. Look at that. Yeah, so maybe having longer labial palps is going to help him kind of sort out maybe floating algae or those types of things. Um, that's possible. You are going to see so many bugs. Um, I'm, a, I'm heading out to Arizona in the end of July. Um, but And normally I drive. Normally I make it a road trip. But this year I will be flying. So it's going to be a completely different experience for me. Because I'm gonna, cause I can't bring all of my collecting gear. I'm going to have to be pretty particular about the collecting gear that I bring on the plane. All right, so that is our beautiful beetle for the day. I am so happy we got to chat and interact with each other for so long. I super appreciate everybody coming and joining us today. Oops, that's not the right slide. There's the right slide. All right, so super thank you for hanging out with me today. Yeah, so, okay, we've got one more. One more. Do the predaceous beetles catch prey with their legs or their labial palps or what? <clears throat> That's a good question because when I'm looking at a predaceous diving beetle, I know that they can swim very fast, right? But they don't have any venom. So when they bite, they're not actually injecting anything into their prey to paralyze them. So a lot of times people think that, um, so a lot of times, I don't know how they hold on to their food. Because their legs just look like basic walking legs. So they don't really have the ability to hold on that way. It's a good question. How do predaceous diving beetles? But it's possible that they only go after very, very small insects. So they easily overpower them and they can just eat them because they're so soft-bodied. Maybe like mosquitoes and aquatic mites. But I wouldn't say they use their legs or their pups to really catch their food. I would say that their pups, they use their pups to kind of push their food into their mouth once they've already caught it. Maybe their strength is purely in their mandibles. Yay! All right, so I wanted to say thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for hanging out with me today. I super, super, super duper appreciate it. Um, I'm happy to see Susan and Avea and Jody, all of you guys coming back every week. I really love hanging out with you guys and chatting and answering all of your fun buggy questions. Um, 
I did finally make it onto the uh, John Muir Law's nature calendar, nature journaling calendar. So I'm gonna be, I'm gonna be having those there, and there's a possibility that I'm gonna be able to expand into Zoom classes, which would be a lot of fun. Um, if there is a Zoom class that you would be interested in taking, go ahead and let me know. Um, I can do things like we can do pinning classes or we could um, practice spreading butterflies or we could do something like that. That would be fun. Um, I also teach on a platform called OutSchool. I teach to students, to children, K to high school. So if you know a little bug lover and you want to, um, and you want to share your love of bugs with your little friends, you can send them my way and I can get them all hyped and excited about bugs and send them back to you so you guys can sketch bugs together. <laughs> all right, that up there is just your reminder to make sure that you subscribe to my channel. You can also hit the little notification bell um, next to the subscribe button so that you get notified when I post new videos. Right about there is where you can donate to Insectopia. Um, that just helps me continue to share my love of bugs with you and um, with, with you and people in the Philadelphia region. Just the, the ability to do this, I'm so thankful for. And it is you, ladies and gentlemen, who make it possible for me to continue to do this. I love it. All right. Um, I also have been doing Guess That Bug, but I haven't done it, admittedly, in a week or two. Um, Guess That Bug is a game that I play on Instagram where I post three images, and you can look at all three images and then guess what the full insect was, and the answer comes at 5 p.m., I also, on my Instagram, recently posted a nature hike through um, a nature hike and did some black lighting a little bit. All right. Woohoo! Yeah, I'm hoping I'm hoping for some new people. Um, I'm looking forward to getting my classes, my Sunday classes on the calendars because if I can get more people on Sundays, that would be awesome. Last week I think I only had like one or two, so it would be really great to have more Sunday people too. Alright, so Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for hanging out with me. I had a great time. I'm happy that you did, too, and that you guys were able to sketch together. So um, I look forward to seeing you all next week. Look at that. Yay! All right, ladies and gentlemen, I will see you around. Stay buggy. Bye!